my first memories of praying are times I've shared before with this congregation over the last decade, but were times when my mom would enter into deep clinical depression, periods that really rocked my world as a kid. Uh, and I was trying to think this week what got me to pray during those times. What, what Did somebody teach me to pray? Did somebody tell me to pray? Or what? And I could not recollect a single time when mom would go into a period of, and I could tell even at seven, eight, nine years old just by the countenance on her face when she was entering into these times of really deep, deep depression. <coughs> I could tell and I would, uh, I would just walk and I would start praying and asking God to do something. And uh, those were really, really honest prayers from a little boy. Uh, I had no idea who God was. I really didn't. Um, but God knew who I was and he knew where I was and he, I am convinced, uh, tuned in to my to my cries but it was my it was my need it was my concerns my burdens that drove me to pray that and I, I again I, I really tried to think surely somebody had to teach me or tell me to pray and it might be an overstatement but I want to say it this way is that it was the only natural response that I knew of in response to something that was overwhelmingly big for me, the only thing I knew, the most natural thing in the world to me as a little boy, I wasn't raised in a Christian home, folks. I, you know, I just wasn't. I didn't know. But something in me cried out to pray. Don't you think it was the sovereign love of a Heavenly Father whispering in my ear? Don't you, don't you think that He was the precipitant of that, that in the mix of pain and fear and sorrow and sadness and wanting things to be different, that God took that moment in my life and he met me there and he whispered, pray. He didn't say, now Casey, I need you to do X, Y, and Z and then pray or Casey, follow this pattern. He just said, come and pray. And in, in my little heart, my little mind, my very, very limited, almost non-existent knowledge or understanding of God, I cried out to him. Things like, help my mom. Things like, God, don't let her be in the hospital long. God, if anybody can do anything, you can. Because <laughs> no one else seems to be able to help. I don't know how much anyone in this room prays. That's really not my concern. And I certainly don't know what motivates you or doesn't motivate you to pray or not to pray. And I don't even know what you think of when you hear the word prayer. Well, there would be a lot of answers to that question if we had time. If I could just read the word bubbles above your heads. I said that was my spiritual gift at one time. I was kidding. But... <laughs> But we would see all kinds of emotional responses, of intellectual responses, of theological responses. And they would be very, very varied, diverse. There would be a lot of different ones. I, I, I don't know if you're excited about a series on prayer or if you're dreading it because you see that as a month-long series of guilt inducement stirs up a lot of stuff for a lot of people when you say pray. I know that. I don't know all the other stuff, but I do know that when we start talking about praying, it stirs stuff with people. From indifference to passion to fear to guilt to all kinds of emotional and intellectual responses. Some of you have read multiple, multiple books on prayer and have theories of prayer and, and are deeply engaged in the practices of prayer. And some of you... Don't even think about it. Maybe you do it, but you don't really even think about it. And maybe some of you never even engage in what you would think of or call or label prayer. Not putting any 
judgments on that this morning. I hope you don't hear any. I'm just acknowledging who's here this morning and, and welcoming you to enter into that awareness that you're in a group of people, that this is a diverse, there's not a unified, consistent response to prayer in this room today. That is, there's not a right track and a wrong track that the majority of people... Now, there is right and wrong in prayer, and there's good and better, and there's all kinds of, of those things, but what I'm saying is I don't want anybody sitting here today go, wow... You know, about 80% of the people have this figured out and he's talking to the me. And they're all just nodding their head because they all know this. That would be a really wrong assessment of the situation. I think the vast majority of us in here struggle with prayer. That's what I think. I don't know it. I'm just saying as, as your pastor, my intuition, my sense is that we struggle whether it's in our understanding of it or the practice of it or both. Let me ask you two questions. One's the subtitle, and it's really the real question. What does it mean to pray? When I ask you to, to consider that this morning, what comes to your mind? What does it mean for you to pray? Second question really is, and it dovetailed, they're, they're, they're linked. Let me ask you this. Do you go to God with your most honest needs and concerns. And, and let me fill that one in too. Do you go to God immediately or eventually? Do you resort quickly to prayer? Or do you resign slowly to prayer? Whatever prayer is to you, how do you respond to your needs and concerns in regards to prayer that that come up in your life. I want you to start thinking now about your most pressing needs and concerns, okay? Don't worry about it whether it distracts you. We're just going to trust that God would kind of bring those things to the surface of your mind as we walk through this message this morning. I'm going to look at uh, an interesting passage of Scripture. I, I think a lot of people are uncomfortable with this. Now, when I say uncomfortable, I don't mean that we disagree with the content. I think that we're a little uncomfortable. We won't even say this. I think we're uncomfortable because the preceding words out of Jesus' mouth that, that this follows are pray in this way. Pray in this way. Here's how to pray. When you pray, pray like this. That's what Jesus said before he gave us his model prayer. Now, if you're like me, I, I'm one of those pastors that will very, very seldom, only if the, the Holy Spirit would just take my words and throw them out for me, ask you to say amen in a sermon. Very, very seldom will I say, repeat after me. Because, and it's my own issue. I don't really have a, a concern of practicality with that. I just don't like myself, and I'm revealing my pride. I don't like to be told how to worship. I don't like to be told how to respond. And so I don't try to do that with you. I don't have any fault with anybody else that does it. I just don't generally do it. Turn to your neighbor and tell them this or whatever, okay? Amen. <laughs> Mike, would you turn to your neighbor and say amen? <laughs> so, when, so when Jesus says pray like this, I can kind of get my free will all bristled up. What do you mean pray like this? You mean I got to pray like this? This is the only way I can pray? I mean, what if I pray another way? Doesn't all prayer count? And all equal? Do I have to pray this every time I pray? Do I have to pray the exact words or just the ideas? What do I do here? What does it mean to pray? What does it mean to pray? Would you stand with me and let me read this scripture together? Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. And Jesus said these words, Pray then in this way. Just listen. Because as soon as I start saying this, you're going to want a lot, many of us are in the tradition of reciting it together, but I want you to just listen, okay? Jesus said, Here's how I want you to pray. Our Father who is in heaven, Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. On earth, 
as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as, also we have, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Father, my one request is that you would use my clumsy words, my oftentimes inadequate preparation, but take my willing heart and mouth and your infallible, all-powerful word and teach us to really pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Man, this is going to be overly simplistic. I know that. Let me say it again because some of you are sitting down and didn't hear me. What I'm going to tell you this morning is overly simplistic. I'm not going to try to dazzle you with deep insights or word studies. But I am going to ask you to grapple with the obvious. And I want you to grapple and wrestle with the obvious today. If you don't do that, if you're not willing, if you're above that, I'm using guilt now. If you've got pride issues there, you'll get out of this exactly what you think, and that is nothing. You're going to have to be willing to come with me in a journey of going, man, I really don't think I know very well how to pray. And I think Jesus knows that enough to say, let me show you what prayer is. Just let me show you what prayer is. Now, I am... I am... uh, really good at forgetting. And I'm also an optimist, and that's the way an optimist would say that. I'm really, really good at forgetting. So I need things in short bursts and concise statements. It's why I try to preach a one-point sermon. You thought that was for you. That's for me. That's so I can remember what the heck am I preaching about halfway through this. If i got three points, I'm never going to get there. One point. Okay. In the verses, let me, let me just do this. In the verses that, that are right before what we just read, the Lord's Prayer, the model prayer, in the verses right before that, Jesus uh, teaches the folks what prayer is not to be characterized by. Okay, so just briefly, let me tell you two things that prayer is not characterized, should, should not be about He says, prayer is not to be done for the approval or respect of others. It's really done for the audience of one. It's not so others will applaud you. It's not so others will be impressed by your words. It's not for any other reason but but to have the direct, undivided attention of God, and and that's vice versa. It's not done for the approval. That's a big deal. Do you know how many people, when they pray, including myself, struggle with the awareness that I'm praying and other people are listening and I can almost put more emphasis or thought to that than the fact that God is listening. And Jesus says, don't do that. Focus in on who your audience is. And the second thing is, is prayer is not for the purpose of informing God or making Him aware of a need that you have. Nor is it about convincing Him to do good. So that second one is is really kind of two, but it's all in one statement. It's not about informing God or convincing God. Okay? To do good. So the model prayer then begins with the singular statement of our Father who is in heaven. It starts with a statement, and it ends with a statement here today. Two declarations of truth. Okay? That's how the model prayer begins. Our Father... You are in heaven, our Father in the heavens. A recognition statement, right? And it ends with one of those two, right? It says at the very end, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. That's Matthew's version, Luke's version. doesn't have that. But it's certainly there. We can certainly embrace it. Certainly a great book ends. Your God... 
in the heavens, of the heavens, in heaven. And it's your kingdom, it's your power, it's your glory forever. Amen. So it has a statement to begin, has a statement to, be, to end. And that statement to begin with is about focusing on the one that we're coming face to face with. It's an incredibly significant part of learning to pray, really is to stop and think about to whom you are praying, to consider your real audience. Jesus says you've wasted your breath and your time, basically, if your audience are the people who are listening to you pray. Have you ever been in the presence of somebody who's really praying to you or for your benefit? Their prayer is really a message to you, an edification, a question, but they're praying clearly. They're praying clearly to the people around them. It can be something anybody in this room would slip into, and myself included, because we're not supposed to be unaware that we're in a group, right? We're not, we're not supposed to be unaware that other people are listening. And so there's a tension there, right? That, that tension should be about, all right, I know other people are listening, and I want to keep that in mind, I guess, but, but my real audience is I want to get lost in conversation, lost in, in petition, lost in this moment with God and to be quite unconcerned about what other people might think. Now, I guess that's where it bleeds over and says, this is where we're going wrong, is this if what other people think would begin to shape how I talk to God. Okay, so, so it's our Father who is in heaven. That's the one we're talking to, and, and you could think about that and soak that in for a really long time. That's not a small consideration, is it? It should probably, not probably, it should stagger us. Every time we pray, we should be aghast with the honor and the privilege and the reverence and the joy and the excitement that we have the audience of God. Somehow, that I, in a way I don't understand, that he is, he is concerned with me. And he is tuned in to my needs and my concerns and, and invites me to voice those, but to recognize as I do that who I am speaking to, who I am speaking with. So it ends with that statement of recognition, yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. So he teaches us to close those prayers, recognizing that our Father is the one who is ultimately in charge. No matter what happens in between the recognition of God as our Father and, and what we say in the middle of there, at the very end he says, now recognize that it's his kingdom, it's his glory, it's his honor, forever and ever and ever, always, beyond all comprehension, it's his, it's his, it's his. But this morning... The one thing that I want you to look at is what's between those two incredibly powerful, incredibly potent, and significant statements of truth. Our Father who is in heaven, it's yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. What's in between there? You know what's in between there? Five requests. You think I'm going to talk about those five requests this morning, but I'm not. We will, but I'm not going to do it this morning. What I'm going to talk about this morning is that in between those massive statements of truth are five requests. Now I want you to think about this. The bulk of the model prayer that Jesus said pray like this, the bulk of that is marked by his teaching us not only what to ask, but to ask. Don't let that simplicity slip by you. It's not just saying, all right, here's what you should ask for. But in the model prayer today, what we have to learn and embrace and wrestle with is that most of what Jesus taught us in that model prayer was to ask Him, to come to Him as I did when I was seven, eight, nine years old and ask Him, express our needs and our concerns and I would dare say even our wants and desires. To ask. Now he, thankfully, aren't you glad, gives us guidance to that, topically, even structurally, and all of that stuff that we'll unpack. But today I think it would be very, very sufficient for you and I to just go, wow, Jesus taught me to ask him for stuff. Sounds selfish, 
when you say it like that, doesn't it? M- many people have said to me that, that, oh, I don't really ask God to do anything for me. That's all dressed up pride. It really is. Because think about that statement with me just for a minute. I don't know. I don't ever ask God to do stuff for me. I just ask Him to do stuff for other people or I just praise Him or I just give Him thanks. I think I've said that. But you know what that's saying? What's the back side of that coin? God, I don't need anything from you. I got it. I'm good. All these other people, they need stuff, so I'm going to pray for them. Isn't that the only alternative to I'm not going to ask God to help me? Because you're not going to go around deficient of your needs being met, are you? Needs. I'm talking about needs. Daily bread, significance, self-esteem, purpose, meaning, hope, joy, peace. You're not, you can't live like that. What are you saying when you say, I don't really ask God to do stuff for me? It's a pretty pious remark, I think. I know we probably don't mean it that way, but I think it reveals that about us. And I appreciate the fact that many are more concerned with the needs of others, but I want to tell you that the, the bulk, it's not all about us either, and I'll, I'll just hang with me, but the bulk of the, of the prayer that is given as a model is, is come ask me. Is it all about you? No. You'll look at that and you'll see that when you look at the model prayer. But our needs begin to be defined by Jesus in this prayer. And that's where we'll go in the future, in the, in the days to come. Our needs will be defined and we'll realize what our needs are if we learn this prayer. But we're also invited to ask him for the simple stuff like my daily bread, which we'll look at later and says, I, whatever I need today, I need you to supply it, God. Whatever I need today, I need you to supply it. So th- here's what Dallas Willard said in The Divine Conspiracy. He said, the picture of prayer that emerges from the life and the teaching of Jesus in the Gospels is quite clear. This is the picture of prayer that emerges in the teaching of Jesus in the Gospels as a whole. Basically, it is one of asking and requesting things from God. Remember last week we said it comes, the, the most common word, I think it's used about 127 times in the New Testament. And that, that word is defined by coming face to face with God and making a request expressing a need or a concern to God. That's how it's defined. And because we should certainly allow the teachings and the example of Jesus to determine what we understand prayer to be, shouldn't we? I mean, that, I'm not asking you to out loud respond, but I am asking you to verbally track or mentally track with me. Shouldn't we let Jesus determine what prayer is? Absolutely, we should. And the clear example in this and many other places is that the central idea of what it means to pray is to ask or request something of God. That's not... Listen, and and this is a divergence from where I've been even in the last five years, but having studied the New Testament about this and this topic, as well as having read authors... I would tell you that prayer, asking God, asking, making requests of God, is not just a form of prayer. It is the central concept of prayer. It's the central concept. Does this... Now, stay... Because I know... I think I can anticipate some responses when I say this, that this sounds like we're making God orbit around us. And, and I want to put that thought to death immediately... This is not about God being our heavenly handyman or a vending machine where you put in some prayers and he dispenses some answers and that he's at our disposal. This is about a father and child relationship. This is about daddy saying to his kids, come to me. Come to me. Not after you've tried all other things and exhausted yourself and smashed your thumb with a hammer and and, you know, shorted out every circuit in the house and come to me first and ask me. 
not just so that you can be comfortable or happy, fat, and wealthy, but so that you can follow the example, the teachings, the authority, the leadership of a loving. What did he declare the very first thing? Father in heaven. Come ask him. Believe me, you'll never get God to orbit around you. Don't worry about that. That's not a concern. It's not a fear. He's not threatened by that concept. He doesn't want it for you because it's a useless concept. But he is inviting you to ask freely and ask often. The course of prayer... The flow of it is never just asking, okay? I understand that. It's never just saying, God, this is what I need. Here's all my needs. And you dump them at him and say, I'll see you later. Please fix my life and walk on. That would be a mistaken understanding, too, of what prayer is. That's why I go back to the very first example that I gave you. When I didn't know where else to turn, what else to do, when I came up against a problem that was much larger and I was much, very aware, was much larger than my ability, that I had no ability to fix it, that as a seven, eight, nine-year-old kid, the only thing I knew to do was to pray about it. To ask God to intervene, certainly on my behalf. But was he unwilling to do that because it would benefit me? No. Yeah. Now listen, I'll tell you something. My mom never recovered fully from clinical depression for a lot of reasons. But I began a journey with God through that that changed the course of my life. I'm not sure I would have picked that course had God said, hey, here's how we can get here if you choose this. I probably wouldn't in my limited wisdom and weakness and fear, have chosen that course of having a mother struggle with that all of her life. But I'm going to tell you something. It taught me a lot. Things that I value today more than I could put words to. Things about prayer that I might have never learned another way and about who God is when we're desperate and needy. And I'm going to let you in on a secret about everybody in this room. We're desperate. And we're needy. The problems that you face, that I face, only reveal that. They don't make us desperate. Please hear me say that again. Your problems in marriage, in money, in health, in purpose, They don't define your need. They reveal it. They make you aware of your dependence. Just as my mother's depression made me aware there is only one person, one being, that could possibly deal with this. I think it's behind the concept as Jesus said, unless you come as a little child, you will never be converted. Don't overthink this. Trust a lot trust simplistic, simplistically. So, it's, let, me, let me say something that's a little bit more academic, and, but I want to make this distinct. There are teachings that thanksgiving and praise, confession, are all different modes of prayer. That conversation itself with God is nothing more than another mode or venue of prayer. And I I don't take great exception with that, but I think that there's a value today in distinguishing those things from prayer. And I say that because the word prayer, the one we're admonished to embrace most frequently, is not defined by those other words. I am not placing it above praising God. I'm not placing requests above worship in prayer or giving thanks in prayer or, or, or giving thanks or, or, or confessing sin. I'm simply saying those are all given their own unique words. 
Thanksgiving is what? Thanksgiving. Confession is called what? Confession. Praise? What's the word for that? Praise. Asking? The word most often used and described is prayer. Now, so that no one walks out of here and says we're never supposed to praise or I didn't say that. It's on the internet and you can go back and listen that I didn't say that. And Dallas Willard talks about this in in perfect detail that there will be very little prayer where there is not a great deal of praise. Wherever there is a great deal of praise, there will be quite often the natural outflow of prayer, of asking and petitioning God. The more you become aware of who God is and His nature and His glory and His majesty, whether it's a sunset or a meditative look at the Psalms, the more you're going to say, you are the answer to my needs. I am given life. I exist for you. You make me what I am. I have no other but you. Quite naturally, we would think it very reasonable to go to that one with any need that we're given, as Jesus clearly, clearly taught. So in, in, in Paul's famous call to, to find peace in Philippians 4, be anxious by, about nothing, but in everything. Listen to what he says. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. He just told us to do three different things. Let your requests be made known to God. When you are anxious, let your requests be made known to God through prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving. But don't dare hesitate to let your request be made known to God. Now, it's hard today because I choose this single point. I back myself in a corner. And if you come here this today and walk out of the sermon series, you will get a very misconstrued notion of what I think prayer is in terms of what the New Testament teaches. So there's my hook for you to keep coming back. Okay? You need to, I just need you to grapple with this. So it's about requesting. It's about asking. I didn't say it's just about asking stuff for us. You will see in the model prayer it's not. It's clearly not. Although every request in the model prayer has great and magnificent and glorious benefit for us. Because anything of God would, would benefit us. Because he's a good, good father in the heavens. And it's his kingdom. And it's his glory. And it's his power forever and ever. And he said, come to me and ask. Bill Hall gives a great quote about the nature of prayer being a request and how important it is. He says, rearrange your life around the practice of Jesus regarding prayer. Look at his life filled with the press of the crowd, the hatred of religious leaders, not his hatred for them, but their hatred for him, and the dullness of his disciples. We relate there quickly and easily. How did he handle it? How did he handle it? He prayed. He prayed alone, and he prayed at special times of pressure and decisions. Please don't hear me say anything that I'm not saying about Jesus, but when Jesus sensed in his full humanity need, when he sensed it, need is not sin. But when he sensed the depletion of his physical body or his spiritual union with God. What did he do? He went and prayed. 
I'm sure he thanked the Father. I know he did. I know that he praised the Father. I know he did those things. But he prayed. He asked God, his Father, to fill him, to renew him. I don't want anyone here to think for a second that giving thanks to God is less, that praising God is less. It's not. It's just, it's just different. I think it's unique. And I think it's important because I think we can get tied up in, in, the, in the lie that, that it's more important to praise God, that it's more important to thank God, that it's more important to confess sin than to actually say, God, I'm needy and I'm broken and I don't have anywhere to go because I'm a nine-year-old boy with problems too big for me. Can you, Daddy, help me? That's not more important than Thanksgiving, but it's as important. Because you're made in His image. And He loved you enough to die for you on a cross. Not to make you God, but because He is God. And you're His child. What parent in here would say, Hey, don't ask me about any of your problems to their child. Don't come to me if you figure it out on your own. What sane parent would, would build a wall that would prevent their children from coming to them with their neediness, their, even their concerns, or even their wants? What parent would say, I don't want you to ever ask me for something you want? It's a good distinction between inviting that kind of conversation and approach and, and inviting a child to be spoiled. Don't, don't get those confused. I understand that. God can say no to you really well. I thought many would say amen there. <laughs> amen. <laughs> yes, he does. But you know what? God says yes to us about things we never ask far more than he's ever said no to you. Yes, I'll give you another sunrise. Yes, you'll get to laugh at that joke. Yes, you get to love. Yes, I'm going to heal your body. Yes, you get a friend. How many good things has God said yes to that you never even asked for? He loves to say yes. Kelly reminded me not long ago how important it is as a dad, as a mom, to find every reason in the world to say yes. find every reason in the world to say yes. Whenever we can say yes, not in the, in the venue of spoiling. I'm, I'm not saying that when we walk through the store and, and, and Griffin wants gummy bears, every time I say yes. I'm not talking about that. I am talking about, Daddy, will you play with me? Yes. Daddy, can we go? Yes. I think that hearkens of the Father who said yes to you and to me far more than we've ever asked Him to. So here's what I want you to do. we will close with this. I want you to think of a need that somebody else has that touches your life. That is, you're concerned about it that it sits upon your life with some significance, that there's an emotional response to it, a burden, a, a sense of compassion or identity that's shared in that. Okay, think of one thing. It didn't take you long, did it? And I want you to think of one need in your life. Maybe no one knows this need, but it matters to you greatly. I don't want you to evaluate whether it should matter or it shouldn't matter, okay? Okay? You can trust God to figure that one out. I just want you to go, what's one need? What's God? Well, this, is, this is sitting heavy on my life. And you identify that. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray together as our growing and going challenge today. We're just going to spend a couple minutes in silent prayer. And I'm going to book in those prayers for us. But I want you to pray about those two things 
in the few minutes, few seconds that we share together. I just want you to bring them at a gut level to God. Don't overthink them. Don't analyze their worthiness. Just bring them. Hey, when I was nine years old, I didn't think a lot about, was it God's will to heal my mom? Was it God's will that I go through this? I just brought my need to him through tears and brokenness and all that. I just brought it. And he met me there. He met me there. And I promise you today, if you'll not overthink it, even if you do, if you'll not overthink it, he's going to meet you there. I'm going to give you a moment of silence. We'll just start. I'll start. And I'm going to just give you a, a minute. And you just talk to the Father. Daddy, you are the one that rules and reigns in the heavens. And you've stepped into our world. You've invited us to look at you face to face. And we come to you right now not out of religious obligation or duty or somehow thinking that we're going to convince you to do good. We come to you because we are broken. We're hurting. On our best days, we're desperately needy. And I want to thank you, God, I, I mean this sincerely. I want to thank you for the pain and the trials and the hardships that make us aware of how needy we are. So, Father, I've asked this precious group of people to think of two things that they could talk to you about. And as they do that, would you hug them and you whisper into their ear, thank you for talking to me and bringing this to me and trusting me. You embrace them. God, help them to catch your gaze of affirmation and love and delight. For even when you reprove us, you delight because you're our daddy. So God, we bring those things to you right now. Father, thank you for the warm handshakes that we've received this morning. For the beautiful music that we got to sing. For the lyrics, they're so true. Thank you for the coffee and sweet taste of those refreshments. Thank you for the power and the significance, the depth and the authority of your word. Thank you that the Holy Spirit is here with us and in us. Thank you for our freedom. And thank you for looking in our eyes and asking us to ask you. Father, my prayer for all of us this morning is that you would really teach us to pray anew. We love you. We stagger around and we stumble. Oh, we're learning. 
we're really learning to love you. And I want to thank you for the enabling, powerful grace that allows us to do that. But you just shower on us. Thank you. Teach us, God, to pray. Really teach us to pray. May we be different than we've ever been before as a, as a church family, but as individuals. Teach us to pray, God, like we've never prayed before. And meet us in those moments. I am praying and asking you to show up with absolute clarity. When heads bow and tears fall or smiles etched across our face as we ask you for one more thing, knowing that you're good enough, that you're wise enough, that you're strong enough and powerful enough to determine what we need and what we don't need, that your no's are as valuable as your yeses, and we trust you with all of that, and I'm so glad we can rest in that. There's no way, God, I could figure all that out. I would never even ask you if I thought I had to figure out the worthiness of each request. I would never. I would be a terrified. So thank you, Jesus, for your intercession there. We love you. We're broken and messed up, God, but we love you. Thank you. Thank you for loving us perfectly. Jesus, we only know the Father by you. It's in your name, amen.